This morning I want to talk about something that's very basic, not simply to the Christian faith, but basic to almost any and every world religion. This morning I want to speak to you about God. I recognize that people use the term God in a variety of ways. Uh, if you are a Muslim, you refer to God as being Allah. A Jewish person refers to God as Yahweh or Jehovah. And while Christians affirm that God's name is Yahweh, we also affirm that the God of the Bible is triune. That is to say that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In our day, there are a number of persons, probably you know some of them, who use the term God rather flippantly or lightly. And this is captured in the popular acronym OMG. There are also persons who employ the term God in a vulgar way, including God in their repertoire of profane phrases. Dear friends, the term God is not an empty cipher. It's not an empty cipher to be thrown about without any thought about what the term means. To know God rightly and to speak of him accurately is of paramount importance. A.W. Tozer, in his well-known book, The Knowledge of the Holy, begins his book with this quote, What comes to our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. What comes to your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. Even in a context like this, I suspect there are differing opinions among us about what God is like. D.A. Carson rightly reminds us, the God of the Bible is self-defined. The God of the Bible is self-defined. In other words, my view of God does not affect or change who he actually is. Often you'll hear a person say something like, well, the God I believe in would never do that. But God is who he is apart from what we wish him to be. God is not confined. God is not limited to what you think he is. When God introduced himself to Moses, he refers to himself as Yahweh. And there's two ways you could understand Yahweh. One is to understand Yahweh as saying, I am. But another way to understand the translation of the Hebrew Yahweh is to hear God saying, I am who I am. I am who I am. Accordingly, what we are able to know about God corresponds to what he reveals about himself. If we presume to know certain things about God, it should be because he has told us those things in the first place. We don't get to imagine what he is like. We don't get to speculate about his nature. We worship God according to his revelation of himself. And this is why I love Isaiah chapter 40. I realize I preached on it last Sunday, but I stayed in the first half. This morning I'd like to get into the second half where God reveals some awesome things about his nature in this chapter, and you'll be helped and edified if you follow with me. If you would like a glimpse of God in all his glory, I invite you to look with me through the telescope of Isaiah chapter 40, beginning at verse 26. Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out their host, that is the stars, by number, calling them all by name. 
by the greatness of his might. And because he is strong in power, not one of them is missing. The way in which God is described here is staggering. Did you know that conservative estimates are that there are nearly 200 billion galaxies in our universe? Nearly 200 billion galaxies. Now, if you research how many stars are in each galaxy, the, the, the number varies wildly. But the average number of stars in a single galaxy is 100 billion. I don't know how to do the math on that. 200 billion galaxies by 100 billion stars. And the Word of God says that God calls each of these stars by name. And not one of these stars is missing. Every one of the 200 billion times 100 billion is accounted for. There's a great quote about Albert Einstein. It's written by a scientific relativity theorist, Charles Meisner. Meisner says, I do see the design of the universe as essentially a religious question. That is, one should have some kind of respect and awe for the whole business. It is very magnificent and should not be taken for granted. In fact, I believe that is why Albert Einstein had so little use for organized religion although he strikes me as a very religious man. Einstein must have looked at what the preacher said about God and felt like they were blaspheming. He had seen much more majesty than they had ever imagined, and they were just not talking about the real thing. Too many of us have domesticated our view of God. Our articulation of who God is is far too small. And I include myself among those who don't think deeply enough about the nature of God as often as I ought. And yet, time and time again in the Scripture, God reveals to us what He is like, and it is breathtaking. Isaiah reminds us, God created the heavens and the earth, and He created the stars, and not one of them is missing. Do you see the combination of His characteristics here? God is not only glorious, God is not only supreme, but He is also attentive to every aspect of His creation. Jesus affirms this in His own ministry, insisting that not a sparrow falls to the ground apart from the Father knowing. Jesus declares that even the hairs on our head are numbered by God. Friends, our knees may knock when we consider God's power, but our hearts should bow in humble adoration as we consider that God uses His strength and His power to assist us. That His power and strength are used to help us, to lift us up. Isaiah closes out this chapter the way he began this chapter, and that is contrasting the frailty of man with the greatness of God. The frailty of man with the greatness of God. Look at verse 28. The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. 
That description is very different than the description of humanity given in verse 30, where it says, even youth shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. Ray Ortland Jr.'s commentary on this says, human strength at its best will inevitably fail. You see, it's not enough that Isaiah said that human beings break down and get tired or weary, that he's picturing the strongest among humanity. All of humanity, every last one of us will grow tired. We will faint. We will fall down. So let me ask you this morning, is there a sense in which you have come here this morning exhausted? Do you know what it is like to be tired? There's no shame in admitting that you are. Because the Bible promises that each and every one of us are going to be tired at some point. Maybe from the pressures you feel in your place of work. Maybe it's pressure you feel within your own home. Pressure from the people you live with. It may be from the burdens you carry in your personal relationships or the burdens you carry for those whom you love deeply. You may be tired simply because you're aware of the expectations that others have placed on you. You may be tired because of the expectations that you've placed upon yourself. Some of you, perhaps many of you, have come here this morning wearied and exhausted by your personal circumstances. And I want you to know that it's normal, it's natural to feel worn out by hardship. And yet here's the good news from Scripture. Though the Christian will grow tired, though the Christian will faint and fall down, the Christian need not languish in this condition indefinitely. We don't have to stay tired. We don't have to stay low, as it were. Because we have gathered here this morning to call upon the one whom, for whom nothing is too difficult. This is the everlasting God. We have come to worship a God who does not faint. We have come to worship a God who does not get weary or tired. But look at verse 29. We gather not simply before a God who has power. That would be enough to cause our worship. We don't simply gather before a God who has power. We gather before a God who gives power. He gives power to the faint. He gives to him who has no might. He increases strength. What do you think about when you hear that? When you read that, do your eyes gloss over it? I read the promise of verse 29 and I say, I want this power. I need this strength. I don't know about you, but I get tired a lot. And I don't mean in a physical sense. Physically, I feel pretty good. Physically, I don't get tired that often. When I say that I get tired a lot, I mean that I have a tired spirit. That there are things, outward circumstances in our life that wear down, wear us down on the inside. We get a tired spirit that comes from bearing all the responsibilities on our shoulders. There is a weariness that emerges from thinking that all of the outcomes depend upon me. And you. I was also reminded that we get a tired spirit from grief. We get a tired spirit from grief. 
Just yesterday, I learned that one of my best friends in the world died. She was also a colleague. She was my administrative assistant for the eight years I was in Toronto. Heather Carver was always a healthy, happy person. She was a strength and a joy to be around. I was feeling pretty good, feeling physically strong, but you hear the word of a good friend dying and your spirit grows tired. And I know, you know what this is like. To physically feel fine, and yet within you is a very tired spirit because you're grieving. Something's missing. Someone's missing. Isaiah promises this. He says you will faint. You will wear down. You will grow weary. Because of our natural limitations, even the best of us will be exhausted, even if it's only on the inside. And I'm reminded this morning, and I preach this to myself because I need it. Verse 29 is the best news. God gives power to the faint. To him who has no might, he increases strength. We can do all the right things, eat all the right foods, do all the right exercises, but what are you going to do when things beyond your control hit you? When a loved one leaves or a loved one dies, where are you going to turn? Where's your strength going to come from? I look to the eyes and ask, where will my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. How do we get this? Is this magic? Is it automatic? How do we get this strength that's being offered here? Isaiah gives us the answer. He says, They who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Notice what it's not saying. It's not saying those who dig down deep, those who just pull themselves together. No, it says those who wait for the Lord. And the Hebrew word for wait implies activity. The Hebrew word for wait implies anticipation. So it's by faith, with a posture of readiness, we're on the lookout, as it were, for God's assistance. With joyful expectation, we pray for God's strength. We pray, we call out to Him for His deliverance, for His assistance. It's hard for some of us to imagine what's being promised here. Mount up with wings of eagles? Some of us just want to be able to get out of bed in the morning. You don't even have to give me eagle's wings, Lord. Just get me out of bed. Help me to be kind to people and not be melancholy or miserable. Maybe our view of God is too small. Maybe we've domesticated our view of God. And perhaps we need reminding that we have gathered before a God who is infinite. We have gathered this morning before a God who is glorious to the nth degree. We're gathered here to worship a God who not only names every star, but he accounts for every one of them. This is a God whose eye is on the sparrow, and his eye is on you. His eye is on me. We have gathered to worship the everlasting God, and our God who does not faint will be able to keep you from fainting. 
And don't worry, even if you faint, even if you fall down, God offers His strength. He promises His might to get you back up on your feet again. And so you need not pull yourself up by the bootstraps. The strength you require is not your own. The strength you need and I need comes from God. And it comes from God alone. I urge you, the most important thing you can do is wait upon the Lord Jesus Christ in joyful expectation, anticipating answered prayer. Wait upon the Lord. Call out to Him. Lean on His strength. The everlasting God promises. He promises to help you. All you must do is ask for help. Amen.